Good morning once again to the Nevada, Utah Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, Conference uh, Morning Devotional. It is good to be back. Um, it is just good to spend time together, look at scripture, and grow together in the knowledge and the love more, more than anything of Jesus Christ. So today we have a special guest, and I'm going to um, invite Michelle. She's going to tell us a little more about her. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Good morning. Today I'm delighted to be able to introduce my good friend Karen. We go way back even before I was baptized as an Adventist. So um, she is delightful. She has a wonderful grief recovery and grief comforting ministry that I'm sure she will share with us today. Um, she's from the Northern California Conference, lives in Auburn and would be delighted to come share her information in your church as well. So um, turning it over to you, Karen, I'll let you have the opening prayer. Thank you. Um, let's ask God to be with us this morning. Father, there's not a moment that you are unaware of us. There is not a detail about each one of us that is overlooked by you. And so we step into this time of coming close to you and close to one another with assurance and confidence that the blessing we each individually need, your spirit will provide. Thank you so much for bringing us together here. Thank you for technology that allows this to happen. Um, but most of all, thank you for being the comforter and the encourager in our hearts and lives that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So it is a good morning. I am so happy when Michelle called and invited me to come and share a few things with you. And um, together, um, I just have to start right off that um, the main question of what we're going to talk about today is for my own self as well. I will um, open up an opportunity for you to respond back. So Joe, does that work? Um, can people talk to each other? We'll, we'll let that happen. Yep. Okay. Okay. That is super. Um, because I'm a pretty engaging kind of person and I don't want to just do a one-way conversation at you. I want us to be able to share together. But I do want to start out with some scripture. Scripture that I think is probably familiar, uh, very familiar to pastors when it comes in times of uh, death and um, services. Um, a few of these passages are, are definitely a part of what's happening. So what I'm going to ask is I would like to invite um, three of you to read the scripture this morning. So do you have your Bibles handy? Who has a Bible handy? Um, take your speaker off mute and you can be the one that will go with it. So Mario's nodding his head. Mario, would you please read for us Isaiah 40 verse one and two? Who else would like to read scripture this morning? Carlos, thank you. I'd like you to read Isaiah 61 verses one to three. And then I need one more reader this morning. I'll read. Okay. Thank you so much. Would you read um, First Corinthians? Sorry, Second Corinthians, verses one, three, and four. Second Corinthians, chapter one, verse three and four. So, we've got three readers, correct? And I'm going to read the fourth one. And um, it's probably the one that's most commonly um, used at um, funerals and memorials. But let's start at the top. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Who would read that, please? I got I'll that. Read I, 1 and 2. 1 and 2? Okay. Isaiah Thank chapter you, Mario. 4. No problem. Isaiah 40, verse 1 and 2 says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith the Lord, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So let's just ask quickly, what is being specifically comforted in this verse? 
or how is comfort coming through? I guess I should say, how is the comfort being applied? What's it being applied to? Oh, it's people. Being applied to people, but what need in the people is it being applied for? Here I see their iniquity to be pardoned. Um, I'm trying to read it again. Sometimes when I read, I, I, I got to read it over and over again. Let me take yeah. a look. So pardon is definitely a piece of that. And we another word, what's another word we use for pardon? Forgiveness. 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 Absolutely. So let's just connect these dots. We'll come back to them <laughs> later. But does comforting have something to do with a message of forgiveness? Yes. It seems like in this in this passage, that was what we're talking about. It's also talking about declare to them, let them know that their warfare is over, their struggle is over. Man, is that a comforting piece? Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, the, the conflict that we experience on this planet, um, can we have a, an, an end of that? Can it come to an end? And possibly that conflict is the internal conflict that we're struggling with our own guilts and our regrets and our shame and our blame and all of that. So I want us to just go deep and, and get what the scripture is telling us. Let's take a look at Isaiah 61, 1 to 3. Okie dokie. Thank you, Carlos. It is, um, it says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Carlos, thank you so much. Big passage. We could spend an hour just taking a look at that more deeply. But if we're going to just take a scan, what is the comfort applied to here? Is this a future tense way out somewhere um, after Jesus comes? Or does it seem to indicate that there is comfort and hope and healing right now in our broken lives? Right For now. here and now. For here and now. This is so critically important. Because sometimes as spiritual leaders, we, we make it all about when Jesus comes back, all of this thing will be gone. All of this will be over. But as my husband often says, right now we're sitting on a hot stove. Mm -hmm. So is there comfort for right now? Is the language that Isaiah is using, he's using language that is associated to deep grief, deep sorrow. And um, so I'm going to just recap what Carlos read. There's good news for the poor. Now, are we talking about financial poverty? Or are we talking the soul poverty? The poverty when our hearts are crushed and we don't have any capacity to, to offer anything to anybody. So yes, physically poor, but let's go deeper. Um, there is comfort to bind up the broken heart. Boy, right there. To set captives free. You know, when people are locked in grief, it is a captivating experience. I can't step out of it by will, can I? Uh, to release the prisoners from darkness. And um, I associate that with that prison of regret and blame and shame. Again, a little hint about forgiveness. To comfort all who grieve to exchange our ashes for beauty, our mourning for joy, and our despair for praise. You know, I've shared that with a um, recent grief coaching client who had had no idea that she could actually live the rest of her life as Isaiah's promise says. She thought she was doomed to live the rest of her life with this pain of loss and grief. So 
what a what a relief for her to have this hope that this can happen in the here and now. So 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Right, that reads, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Verse 4, mm -hmm. comforts us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in, tr in the trouble uh, with comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. This is my question I ask myself today and I ask all of us. How are we being comforted by God? It seems to indicate here that we can only export something that we have experienced. So I want to hear from you. When, where, and how in your life have you experienced God comforting you? I'll give you a few seconds to kind of mull this question over. How has God comforted me? It's interesting, uh, Mrs. Nicola, that it happens at uh, some of her lowest moments, um, but 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 it's, it's amazing. I can think of one occasion when I actually felt the presence. I felt an arm around me um, because I was I was grieving so much, and I needed uh, the presence of God, and I just felt His presence. The only time in my almost fifty years old that I ever felt the presence physically, but 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 He did that because. He's amazing, you know, and, yeah. but, but it is interesting that it is at the lowest moments. And I don't think so. I don't think it's because that's when God shows up, but it's, that's when we need him the most. And he is able to do that for us, you know, when we really seek him out, basically. So Carlos, what you said was very critical. You said it's not because that's when God shows up. Are you meaning that God has showed up already? He's already present. Always. That's what yeah. that, that is, you know. And yet we kind of give this indication that God kind of comes and goes in our <laughs> lives and he'll show up when you really need him. And when you don't, you're kind of on your own. Um, but would that be a misrepresentation in some way? Yeah, hmm. definitely. So if if we're deeply aware that God is present 24 seven. And what you just said, Carlos, was that in that deepest, darkest pain, you are more receptive mm -hmm. yeah. to that presence mm -hmm. of God. Yep. So that our suffering actually is the gateway of intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. Mind boggling, but it's true. It's definitely true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So someone else, share with us. Yeah. Um, how have you been comforted uh, by God? I, I could um, bring this back to um, the death of my grandmother in 2009. Um, she was like the most meaningful person in the world for me, you know, from ever since. And um, just the day she died, um, 3.15 that afternoon, I went to her hospital bed and, and she was struggling. And I know that um, a number of the things that she had, we have been praying for. And uh, we were praying for um, family members who have not accepted Christ. And uh, what was very interesting, you know, I find myself in this conversation with my grandmother and I'm saying to her, you know, uh, mama, you, you taught me everything I know about God. And I, I'm saying your, your, your goals will be my goals. I'm going to carry on this legacy and I'm going to make sure and I'm going to do my very best to, to um, bring the gospel to the family, you know, and, and just and do uh, and represent you. And, you know, as we went back and I just saw this piece in her 
in, in her being and her face. And uh, a few hours later, she passed. And I was just comforted uh, with the fact of the the promise that God has given and it, it just it's like all the theology all the teachings and everything came to the head at that point and um, I felt relieved one with the death of my grandmother that she was not suffering but then I had this life aim now to carry on her you know her plans and uh, ironically, about a year later, uh, many of the family members, they came to my church and we had a mass baptism. <laughs> it was just, it was just wonderful. And, you know, it, it over the years, you know, you, you see this, um, the family members just uh, coming together and, and, you know, not everyone, but it, it was just so meaningful. And um, that comforted me just in the promise and everything just came right down at that intersection and was a blessing. Oh, that is a beautiful testimony. Absolutely beautiful testimony. So you experienced both peace in your grandmother's rest in the Lord. Yes. And you experienced a mantle laid on you. Like you accepted that you received um, gladly and willingly so that there was purpose or meaning mm -hmm. to carry on. Yeah. while she rests. That's right. Wow, O'Neill, that is that is powerful. That is truly, truly powerful. Somebody else want to just give us a, a, a quick story of, of how you have been comforted by the Lord. Well, we'll keep moving on because what we want to be able to say is then, how am I comforted? Because that's the comfort by which we are to comfort others with. Now, here is the caveat. Carlos, you experienced this warm arm, this evidence that God was with you in this deepest, darkest. And guess what? I did not. As we knelt by the side of our son's bed in his bedroom, as he was breathing his last breath, there was no physical evidence. I had planned on it. <laughs> I was looking for it. I was looking for it because he died just, just at that darkest moment before sunrise. So I was thinking maybe, will I see a, a, a warm glow through the window? Will I feel this arm around me? Will I feel the, the, the sense, this presence that God is indeed with me? And there was none of that physical evidence for me. And I struggled with that for a number of months. Like, so God, where were you when I needed you? Until the pastor who came um, an hour or so after Dawson died, um, he was walking, um, the physician, our pediatrician was with us. She came to our home to help all of us be uh, at comfort and just to have her presence with us and know what to do. And as she, he didn't tell us the story for a couple of months later, but apparently as she was walking out to the car, he went with her and um, Dr. Sarah Warner said, you know, I've been with other families when their children die. And I have never been with a couple who was as peaceful as Steve and Karen. And when the pastor told me that, that was my missing puzzle piece. <laughs> I didn't have any external evidence that God was there, but where was he? Peacefully inside. <laughs> now, I say this because Carlos has a really vivid, different experience than mine. And so if I'm going to comfort another person with the comfort I have received, <clears throat> I need to be very aware that they will receive comfort from God differently because look at my thumbprint and your thumbprints are completely different. Every human's grief is unique to them. So when, when Paul is talking about comfort others with the comfort you have received, 
maybe we can make that application that it's not in its specificity, mm -hmm. but it's in the fact that we received comfort. And we don't know exactly how God is interacting to comfort the other person, but do we have a testimony that God does comfort? Mm -hmm. mm. And so with that, you see, if we have that testimony that God does comfort, please let's lay aside the specific way that he comforted us and come with the confidence that he will specifically comfort them. How does that work for you? I love it because we all have different experiences and, and the reality is that the presence of God is already there. Um, and, 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 you know, somehow... It is our awareness, and and he always he's always there. So and, and he, he looks different because we're all different. We have different experiences, and therefore we cannot uh, prescribe a way God is going to come for someone. And at the same time, we cannot. I'm going to use the word criticize for lack of another words. Criticize the way God has comfort and brings comfort to other people. In other words, it's up to God. The reality is that the comfort is there and the presence is there. And adding to that, Carlos, that's beautiful explanation. I love your expanding on that. Is it not God who is our perfect heart reader? Mm -hmm. I cannot look into the heart and the mysteries of another human's life, but I can know God reads my heart and God knows their heart and he interacts with them in the way that works for them. So I want to just share a brief story as we're kind of wrapping some things up. I have a coaching client, um, again, relatively new. And um, part of the coaching work I do involves um, having them use our book, Comfort for the Day. And um, as she has engaged with her Comfort for the Day book and has found hope um, for the pain that she has been carrying for two years, she has not interacted with her grief for two years. Now, let me ask you, do you think you know anybody who hasn't been interacting with their grief? Yeah, I think we all know people who just stuff it. And um, she has stuffed it for two years, but it's not getting better and it's not going away. And she has been guided to, by the Holy Spirit to say, I want to deal with my grief now. So in just a matter of a couple of weeks, she received her Comfort for the Day book, started to interact with it, and then began to pass on the comfort to someone else with the comfort that she received. She met somebody at work, um, a young woman about her age, whose, whose father just died recently of COVID complications. And in talking with this friend, they both identified that they had deep and meaningful relationships with their dad. And so in her very safe way, she said, you know, I've just started reading this book and it's so fantastic. It's called Comfort for the Day. It's really helping me. I just thought maybe it might help you. So here's the connections to, get, to pick up a book and to, to get started. Now, what a gracious way she didn't say, well, you have to do it the same way I'm doing it, did she? She just testified to what was working for her and let that sit in the place of the person that she was sharing. So she, in her early grief recovery journey, is now already reaching out to comfort another with the comfort that God is giving her. Isn't that a beautiful testimony? I just loved her story when she told it to me last week. So um, as we wrap up, comforting is not fixing or taking away someone's grief. It is necessary that we grieve. It is not comforting that we fix. Um, comforting then is a matter of coming alongside so that no one is left alone or isolated in their grief. You know, the comfort that God gives us is the assurance that he's with us, right? So we comfort someone else with the assurance, hey, I'm with you. 
it's also with the knowledge that I can't fix your grief. This is your story of how God is going to comfort and bring healing to you. Comforting, coming alongside is always also acknowledging that this is painful. This is tough. This is not easy to live through this kind of suffering. However, does the word of God give us the assurance that all the issues that are involved with our regrets, our blame, our shame, our guilt, God has already forgiven? Is that comforting, assuring good news? Is it assuring good news that, that the comfort that I need right now, God is already interacting so much so that I'm going to be a, like, a, like this mighty oak tree planted by the Lord for the glory of his splendor. So then, only then, I believe, and after that, do the words of Thessalonians, which are the words we almost go to first, now do these words have greater power for us. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest. Well, what does that mean unless we've applied the other passages we've just looked at today? Mm. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that, we are, that those that are alive and who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not go before those who have fallen asleep, but the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we are still alive, will be left caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. And then it says, encourage or comfort one another with these words. But these words have so much more application when we know that the hot stove of grief we're sitting on right now, God is already present and interacting and we can support one another. So if you don't have a supply of comfort for the day and are ready to give them away to the hurting people that you encounter, your conference office is going to help you know how to get that taken care of, okay? I know our time is up. Um, I would like to have somebody have our closing prayer and blessing over the Nevada, Utah conference. Who would like to volunteer to do that? Mario, did you say yes? Your, your speaker was off. Sure, I can pray for us. Thank you, Mario. Yes, let's pray. <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the words that we heard today, comforting words to us and lord we know that you are our comforter and you've asked us to also help comfort the needs of others as well so i pray over lord the nevada utah conference i pray over those who are watching and listening lord that not only we will receive comfort from you but that we will help comfort others amen. so we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in jesus name amen 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 Thank you so much, Mrs. Nicola. We, we appreciate you very much. We appreciate the ministry that you have led for years now. And uh, it's interesting that through the pandemic, it, it has now become front center in the world. Um, I happen to believe uh, from a very uneducated individual like myself that we are going through a, a season of grieving as, as a world. Um, just yesterday, another pastor friend of mine died. The day before, another of my teachers in the seminary died. I mean, it is it is amazing. It's crazy, and and we have this amazing God. And and I think one of the things that I learned today, or that I was reminded of today, is I I've always um, attempted in my own personal life to to understand grief and to be able to work through the stages and to be able to be healthy in that sense. Um, but I often don't think of the fact that other people are in that same journey and that they have different experiences and that my, my love and my patience and my all these wonderful things that God is for me 
can really help someone else. Um, and, and, you know, once again, just that's yesterday, I called the brother of the person who died, who's a friend of mine, close friend of mine. And, and you know, the, you find yourself in those situations where there's nothing you can say, but just the fact that you called and you were there, it, it makes a difference in their heart, in, our, in your own heart. And the last thing I want to say is that it is amazing how God utilizes this sin thing uh, that allows death and, uh, and allows all these things that produce grief in us. Uh, it allows those things for us to learn, to grow, mm -hmm. to grow deeper in our faith, in our knowledge of God. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a very quick story. I know we don't have a lot of time, but a very quick story. My father died. I am at the funeral. Um, I, am, I am beginning to walk behind the casket. This, this happened in Mexico. You walk the streets, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the casket, the mm -hmm. car. And I'm, I'm the first person right behind um, my other siblings decided to go in a car. I'm, I'm, I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I, I'm confronted with the idea that my father was not a seven-day Adventist. And I'm confronted with this, I believe, devilish, you know, mm -hmm. sinful idea that this is said, that he's done, that that's it. But then all of a sudden, I felt amazing because all of a sudden I said, I, I asked myself, who am I to decide where my father is going to spend eternity? Right. I am no one. I am no one. And, you know, you can call it, um, you know, coping, whatever. But the reality, I learned at that moment as I'm walking be behind my, my father that I am no one to decide and to think. We, we have idea, ideas, but no one to say where people is going to spend eternity. Therefore, this is what I said. I said, Lord, surprise me. You are a God of surprises. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about that. And, 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 you know, just that simple thing that God did for me at that very moment that helped me through my grief. Um, I was able to help someone else in, in Las Vegas that was going through the same thing. And it, she lost a son, very sad death. Um, just about, I think it was last year. And, and at the end of, I preached a sermon at the church and she, she wanted to talk to me. And I listened and I said, wow, this is exactly what I was going through. And I said, listen, here's what happened to me. And she says, wow, I never thought of that. And I said, that's the reality. You and I don't decide that, that's God. Therefore, we're not going to torment ourselves with knowing what's going to happen. Let's just trust God, and, exactly. you know. And so anyway, it's it's the, the the learning that you get, the 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 deepening of your faith when you go through the grief. I think that's part of the why the devil um, allows people to stay stuck in, in different stages because he does not want you to grow and learn and deepen and all these amazing things, right? So. Thank you so much for your ministry and thank you for spending time with us this morning, okay? Oh, you're welcome, Carlos. It has been an honor to meet with your Zoom worship today. Truly an honor. Thank you for the invitation, Michelle. Yes. Well, thank you so much, friends, for being here with us. Um, join us Monday to Thursday, every, every day of the week, except for Fridays, um, because we take time to pray with the pastors at the same time. But Monday to Thursday, we have devotionals, and we oftentimes individuals like Mrs. Nicola that have a really, really um, have a ministry out of uh, specific things like today. And uh, we pray that you continue to grow and that we all continue to grow in Jesus Christ. So thank you so much for being here.